uh, what we want to do now is shift gears to get to the heart of the matter. If the heart of the matter is sola cum solo, who is this solus? Who is this God? And, you know, I, you learn a lot of things as a teacher over 50 years. And if I've learned anything very clearly, for me, this is the nub of the issue. Thinking about God. And uh, it's, this is delicate territory because we're delicate human beings and we're fragile. Um, but what I want to try to, to think with you about for the next hour or so is this mystery we call God. And it's not easy. I'm looking at the words of St. Augustine. If you have understood, then it's not God. I have to keep reminding myself of that, you know. Um, if, if you think you've understood God, it's not God you've understood. <laughs> because what we mean by that is, by, is saying God is mystery. And a mystery is different from a problem. A problem is something you can figure out for yourself, given enough data, enough evidence, uh, pursuing lines of inquiry, and so on and so forth. You say, now I've got it. But that's not God. You've never got it. <laughs> uh, God is an excess of understanding that only comes to completion, if even then it does, when you meet God face to face in heaven. So that's kind of a caveat emptor right at the beginning, you know. I haven't got it, and I'm not going to give you what I haven't got. <laughs> but maybe we can look a, 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 at some lines of thought that are helpful. And the Catechism says the same thing. We must, the Catechism uh, advises us, continually purify our language of everything in it that is limited, image-bound, or imperfect if we are not to confuse our image of God, the inexpressible, the incomprehensible, the invisible, the ungraspable, with our human representations. And then the last sentence, our human words always fall short of the mystery of God. Uh, we, can, we know that, but we kind of forget it. It was put in very attractive language for me years ago, reading an essay by the Dominican theologian Herbert McCabe, uh, where he said, all language for God, no exceptions, all language for God is like second-hand clothing, not made to measure. Uh, if you're buying your trousers in Goodwill, you pick out six pairs, some are too tight, some are too short, and, and so on, because they don't fit you. All language for God somehow falls short of the mystery, because we're dealing, all of our language comes from created reality. There's no exception to that. And so we're reliant upon created reality, or in Herbert McCabe's words, second-hand clothing, to clothe uncreated reality, the creator that is God. And sometimes people say, well, what about the language Jesus used? And I usually say, well, let's be very careful. He's fully God, and he's also fully human, sin alone accepted. So even the language our blessed Lord used is the most privileged kind of language with which we have access to God, Father. But it's still human language. It's still human language. And then the late um, Father Birchall, Holy Cross priest, uh, said somewhere, uh, most of my, my citations I give reference to at the bottom of the page, there is nothing very astonishing about a God who loves us relentlessly, 
except that we generally do not believe in one. I think he's right, you know. I mean, every one of us here would affirm without any hesitation that God is love, right? We know that. We've heard it so many times. It's, it's in our heads. It's in our hearts. But it's, it's one thing to know that in that kind of conceptual sense. And it's another thing to know it in your guts. You know, and that's where hesitancy creeps in. So, some basic guidelines for thinking about God. The problem is not with God. The problem is with us. Um, I think it would be non-heretical to say God is problem-free. We're not. We're not. Um, going back to that description of ourselves as confused, bewildered, and a jumble of different emotions, and so forth, with which we um, engaged yesterday afternoon, that clouds and filters the way we think of God, even at our best, even at our best. And I think I would go a little further and say that more harm is done by people who, though lacking any profound degree of self-knowledge, are pretty sure they know everything about God. <laughs> uh, we can do so much damage here. It's sacred ground. I like that passage in the book of Exodus when Moses encounters God and he takes off his shoes because in his encounter with God, this is holy ground. I'm not recommending that we do that now. Um, but we could do it metaphorically or imaginatively, couldn't we? We're not clear, and our lack of clarity is very often projected onto God. At one level, you can't avoid it. You have to speak. If you don't speak of God and remain silent, that's not an awful lot different from thinking there's nothing there to speak about. You have to speak about God, but you need to be careful. Um, one theologian, Gerald O'Collins, an Australian Jesuit, once said that the theologian, that's all of us, is someone who is careful in their talk about God. Well, that's what I'm advocating this morning, being careful in our talk about God. One English, or actually one Scottish Jesuit, Gerard Hughes, in a beautiful book that I read in the 80s and that I keep returning to every now and again, uh, God of Surprises, uh, puts it so, so well, and you have it in that second bullet in the passage cited from Hughes. It begins on the second line down in that bullet. We are constantly attempted, do you see where I am? We are constantly attempted to make God in our own image, to divinize our narrowness and self-importance, and then call it the will of God. God is mystery, a beckoning word, and he calls us out beyond our narrowness. Our one security is that he is not in our formulation of how he is. Our notion of God is mediated to us through parents, teachers, and clergy. We do not come to know God directly. If our experience of parents and teachers has been of dominating people who show little affection and respect for us as persons, but value us only insofar as we conform to their expectations, then this experience is bound to affect our notion of God and will influence the way we relate to him. Our notion of God is not only inadequate, it may also be distorted. Powerful words. I remember some years ago, <clears throat> reading the um, autobiographical memoir of a theologian, a Methodist church historian called Roberta Bondi. 
took some courage, I think, to write this book. I can't remember the title, I think it is Memories of God. But in this book, uh, Bondi describes her own early years with her parents, uh, brought up in a Methodist family. But her dad was a perfectionist, you know? A perfectionist in the sense that he expected great things of his children and they never quite measured up to his uh, bars of excellence. And so Roberta, um, uh, as an adolescent, started to play the violin. And she was not great uh, in her early years of trying to practice uh, the violin. And he always came down on her for it. You're useless. Do something that you can achieve, and that's not going to be much, and so on. And it constantly degraded her in that kind of way. And then he abandoned the family. And in the autobiographical memoir, Roberta says, as I started to deepen my Christian faith, I found it impossible to address God as Father. I found it impossible to address God as Father because my experience of fatherhood, of, of parenting, was so awful that I couldn't use this word of God. And of course, later on in life, she, she comes to a more balanced perception. But that's exemplifying what we're talking about here. So what would be common distortions of God? Well, I've put down some that I think um, are um, fairly common distortions of God. One is the invisible superpower who is out there somehow. Uh, it, it, that's a kind of a banal way to put it, but some kind of God is out there, up there, somewhere in heaven, and uh, not really conjoined to our world in any way, shape, or form. Well, that's nonsense. That's just nonsense. But people people do uh, have that point of view. You Sometimes, I know it's being said, it, often in a jocose uh, way, the man upstairs. <laughs> there's no man. There's no upstairs. <laughs> <you know? laughs> God is everywhere. Um, so th that's a distortion that's, um, that's, uh, that's still around. The ever watchful policeman. I think we all grew up with a bit of that, you know. Have you ever heard it said, God sees everything. And even those things that you think are done in secret, God sees them. Well, he needs help. <laughs> because, you know, that's a kind of a stalker God, you know. <laughs> Uh, and while it's true that God is aware of us in our entirety, yes, that awareness is nothing but unbounded, unconditional love. He's not a policeman. The God who doesn't care about our enemies, that, that's a very potent thing in our country. And sometimes... Uh, when um, public figures speak of God, it's the God who's on our side, but he's not on the side of the Taliban, or he's not on the side of some other group. And that's, that's a terribly destructive way of thinking of God. The God who despises human happiness, the solemn bore, or spoil sport, that's something I made reference to yesterday, growing up, in a, a, an Irish Catholic family, if you like something, it must have been a sin. You know, God's in competition with the stuff you enjoy. Well, that's nonsense. God wants us to flourish, to flourish as human beings, and isn't there to say, oh, don't do that, and don't do this. There are very few limitations that God imposes on us. Or the God who says, you'll pay for that. <laughs> Swat, you know. Oh. Or, or lastly, and this is perhaps a little bit more um, uh, complicated, 
the God who is a specialist in souls, as if your body didn't count. That's nonsense. It's technically heresy. Um, there's no such thing as a soul without a body. There's no such thing as a body without a soul. That's traditional Catholic teaching. But sometimes, you know, that black thread that I mentioned a little bit yesterday, the black thread in the tapestry of our lives and of our church, says, well, really God's interested in what's happening between your ears and your brain in your intellectual function, but not what's happening in your body. So um, how you conduct yourself bodily uh, is something that's alien to God. How you make love to your spouse, God is not interested in it. Of course he is. Not as a stalker, but, but as one who is the very ground of everything that we are, closer to us than we are to ourselves. And that leads author J.B. Phillips to say once, if people could see beyond their little inadequate God and glimpse the reality of God, they might even laugh a little and perhaps weep a little. So with those caveats in mind, uh, let's recognize that it's not just you and me, the ordinary punters who get this wrong occasionally, it's the experts. And here's just a beautiful example of that. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 26, verse 17. Look at these two translations, one from the New Revised Standard Version and one from the Jerusalem Bible. Just read them very quietly to yourself and see what you notice as the, the serious difference. So what's the difference? If you don't see the difference, leave now. <laughs> Good. Say it again, please. But only if. Isn't that interesting? I mean, are, are translators intelligent people? Well, clearly they are. But in the New Revised Standard Version, we have a far more exact translation than we have in the Jerusalem Bible, where in the New Revised Standard Version we read, Today you have obtained the Lord's agreement to be your God, and for you to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, and his ordinances, and to obey him. It's a covenantal situation between God and the people, Moses speaking. The Jerusalem Bible. You have this day made this declaration about Yahweh, that he will be your God, but only if you follow his ways, keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and listen to his voice. You could imagine the translator's mom standing over him <laughs> as he's, uh-huh, yeah. Only if. You know, it's also, God directed is the first one, the person directed is the second one. Thank you for that, thank you for that. It's true. It's all about God in the first one. But uh, there's a little bit of anthropocentric narcissism in the second one, you know. But it's that only if in Hebrew, showing off, it's one letter. One letter of the alphabet, the letter W, which normally just means and. But what's happened is the new RSV translates that W, the and, literally. You have obtained the Lord's agreement to be your God and for you to walk in his ways. But the, the translator in the New Jerusalem Bible has changed it substantially. Only if you follow, if it was only if we're all in trouble. Because we don't. We don't. So that's what we notice. It's, How, it's not unconditional love. 
That's exactly right. It's very conditional. And that's us. <laughs> that's a distortion. <laughs> Oh, and sometimes it's their own. That's where children become conflict of That's right. In a certain way to be loved unconditionally. That's it. That's it. You've put your finger on the pulse there. If those are ways of getting God wrong, how do we get God right? I cannot think of a better description of God in the entirety of our scriptures or tradition than the one offered us in the first letter of St. John. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God and God in him. I think there's nothing that is superior to that, because we know what love is. Isn't it the highest aspiration of the human heart? You want to love, to empty yourself with regard to someone else, and you want to experience that. You want to experience yourself as one who is loved. In terms of our ordinary human daily experience, there's nothing higher than love. Well, let's put that onto God, second-hand clothing, but God could not be less than that. This self-emptying, excessively generous kind of love, which is what we aspire to be at our best. And as you pick up the tradition, you can see this. One of my favorite poets is the late 16th and early 17th century poet and theologian George Herbert. Herbert was brought up uh, in a very large household, his father died when he was still in elementary school age, and his mom was left with a squad of kids, I don't remember how many, but seven or eight kids, and she was at her wit's end. And so she ruled these kids with an iron rod, you know? You know, she was a very devout Christian, Magdalene Herbert was her name, uh, she was a very devout Christian, but she was tinged with Calvinism, which was very much in the air at the time. And it was a, you know, to keep a tight rein on the children, she used God, as it were, as an instrument, you know. God sees you. God knows what you're doing. Keep in line, you know, that kind of thing. Herbert grows up. And after his mom dies, he becomes a priest in the Church of England. He becomes a priest. And as he develops his own spiritual life, he makes a transition from this kind of hard view of God to the view of God as nothing but love. And it comes to superb expression in this beautiful poem, Discipline. It's a prayer to God. I, I sometimes use this prayer preparing for confession. So he, he says to God, uh, look at it with me, throw away thy rod, throw away thy wrath, O oh my God, take the gentle path. It's what he didn't experience as a child. For my heart's desire unto thine is bent, I aspire to a full consent. I want to love you. I want to be one with your will. Not a word or look I affect to own, but by book and thy book alone. He wants the scriptures to be the rule of his life. And then comes what I think is one of the most beautiful stanzas in English poetry. Though I fail, I weep. Though I halt in pace, yet I creep to the throne of grace. I really love that, because that's me. Um, I fail, and my failures, looking back on my life, bring me sometimes to tears. 
I'm trying to move towards God, but I'm not running. I'm not a marathon runner. My pace is halted. Yet I creep to the throne of grace. I, I find comfort in knowing I'm a creep. <laughs> and then Herbert continues. And remember, he's addressing God. He's speaking to God. Let wrath remove. Love will do the deed. For with love, stony hearts will bleed. And he's right. You know, if you're ever in a situation of conflict with another, and the temptation is, you know, to get back, to be defensive, to hurt as you have been hurt. Uh, but this is saying, let wrath, let anger get out of the picture. Love will do the deed, for with love, stony hearts will bleed. And I think that's true. Um, uh, love melts malice. And then he uses some metaphors. Love is swift of foot, loves a man of war, and can shoot and can hit from afar. Who can escape his bow? In other words, God is love, and he's aiming to get you with his love, and you can't escape. He's a great shot. You're in his crosshairs, so to speak. And then, then with remarkable boldness, he says to God, and he's still addressing God, he says to God, that which wrought on thee, brought thee low, needs must work on me. Wonderful lines. Uh, paraphrasing them. You are love. You are love for us. It is your love for us that brought you low to become one of us. That which wrought on thee brought thee low. That kind of love which you are must work on me. Throw away thy rod. Throw, though man frailty is hath, thou art God. Throw away thy wrath. Pretty powerful poem you know um i love george herbert i whenever i go on my own retreat i take a volume of his poem it's all marked up now over decades because i find myself so moved by the mystical intuition that he has of god um i keep telling my kids that uh, i want one of herbert's poems recited at my funeral if they remember. <laughs> um, the poem is entitled, uh, in the uh, usual editions of the, his poetry, Love Three. I remember one of the kids saying to me, well, why three? Because he tried writing this poem twice before, okay, and never got quite where he wanted to go with it. So Love Three is the name of the poem. And when he'd finished this poem, uh, he wrote the Latin word finis, which means the end. He died a few weeks later. He, knew, he died young of tuberculosis from visiting his parishioners. Uh, they were country folk. Uh, this is long before epidemiology had developed and so on. And, and he knew he was dying. And this was the last thing he wrote. And so it's the last thing he wrote, as it were, chronologically in his life, but it's also the last thing he could write about God. And it's magnificent. I should have copied it to you, but I didn't, so I'll recite it. <laughs> if I can remember. <laughs> the poem is Love Three, and you have to, you have to um, imagine for yourself God's banquet, which is, of course... The Eucharist, right? So God is inviting us to his banquet, the Eucharist. And Herbert is the soul. It's a conversation between God and the soul. Love bade me welcome. Yet my soul drew back guilty of dust and sin. Yet quick-eyed love observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, 
sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, the ungrateful, oh my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and gently did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. I know you not, says love, who took the blame. My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. You know, God welcomes us to his banquet, the Eucharist. And if we're sensible people, we think, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters. Right? And that's what we do, isn't it? I get, I, love doesn't care about that. We say we're unworthy. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, etc. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter to God. Who is worthy? You shall be he. I'm the unkind, the ungrateful. I can't even look on you. And that most beautiful of images, love took my hand. Can you feel that? Love took my hand and gently did reply, who made the eyes? But all the protestations of the sinful soul are dismissed by this God who wants you to sit down, not to serve, but to eat. Oh, it's fabulous. I could go on and on about it. Yeah. But uh, uh, that's for another time. George Herbert, God. So God is the love that is the logic of the universe. Bill Shaw, 20th century Scottish Presbyterian theologian. It's always important for me to recognize other ecumenical insights. God is nothing but mercy and love, the great Therese of Lisieux. The Dominican Father Paul Murray, a theologian and poet, God loves us so much that if any one of us should cease to exist, God would die of sadness. That's the language of paradox. A God can't die, by definition, as it were. But if I should cease to exist, God would die of sadness. What a beautiful image of God. Going over the, 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 the page to the late Father Andrew Greeley. Our God is a God of second chances. Thank you, Jesus. And third, and fourth, and fifth, and in order chances. Amen. He never gives up on us. That there's so much consolation in that, and yet also so much challenge, you know. And there's that beautiful passage from the second section of the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, where God is speaking through the prophet, and this is to the people in exile who have sinned, who haven't kept covenant with God, and so on and so forth. And so God says to the people, can a mother forget the baby at her breast? and have no compassion on the child that she has borne. Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. What a marvelous passage. 
What one recent author that I've uh, been looking at, uh, the Jesuit spiritual writer, Father Paul Cretinho, <coughs> describes writing an assignment on that passage for his scripture teacher when he was in seminary. And Cretinho had the idea, God's writing my name on the palms of his hands, let's tattoo him. So Cretino suggests that that might be the image that Isaiah has in mind. God has tattooed your name on the palm of his hand. Well, I'm not a great advocate of tattoos, but uh, that's a fabulous way of thinking about God, and it's the truth of our tradition. And then, uh, last uh, bullet in that sequence of three on page four, comes from uh, the Czech priest, um, Czechoslovakia, theologian and psychotherapist, Tomas Halic. This is one of the best books I've read in 10 years. And, and this is what Father Halic writes. God happens where we love people, our neighbors. Jesus refuses to exclude anyone a priori from the category of neighbor, not even enemies. I am convinced that the two questions, does God exist and does love make sense, are not only conditional on each other, but they are actually one and the same question. I know of no better translation of the statement, God exists, than the phrase, Love makes sense. You can't love God without loving the other. Even when the other gets up your nose. <laughs> you can't love. It's not possible. It's not possible to love God and to mean it as authentically as we can and be a swine to live with. <laughs> You've got it wrong. It's a distortion. How do, you, how do you measure your love for God in all kinds of ways, but foundationally in the way you regard others? There's nothing new in this. Go back to the 25th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. What, what I find as some terrifying words of our blessed Lord you know the passage, it's the parable of the, of the judgment, you know. And the people come before the Lord in judgment. And uh, uh, he says to the just, or the just say to him, When did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or in prison, and minister to you? And you remember the Lord's terrifying words in response. When you did it to the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Oh, oh, I find those words terrifying. They bring you up short. You know, it's so easy to join my hands and tell God that I love him. It can be a hell of a challenge to relate to someone else with that kind of unconditional self-effacing, generous outreach, but that's the measure of it. I'd like to draw this conference to a conclusion with a prayer from a little-known Catholic theologian, John Tully Carmody. Carmody died, oh, must be 25 years or more ago, from multiple myeloma. And as he was in his last weeks in this world, he wrote a series of um, reflections uh, to share with his uh, wife and his family members. And some of them are immensely beautiful. And what I've done is I've, I've copied one for you. And perhaps we can bring the conference to an end by praying it together. So it's... Uh, the passage that begins praying with John Tully Carmody. And so together, 
you give us two commands and let them merge into one. We are to love you with all our hearts and to love our neighbors as ourselves. More simply, we are to love always and everywhere, our friends and our enemies, the skies above and the earth under our feet. For you are love, and those who abide in love abide in you. It could not be plainer, more sharply focused. The greatest of your gifts is love. Love is our only crucial obligation. I love you, God, and have for all my adult life. I love you badly, distractedly, impurely, but from first I knew what your name meant, first received the slightest inkling, I knew you were all I needed or wanted, and my life gained purpose and order. What shall I return to you for all the favors that loving you has brought me? I shall dwell in the thought of you, the hope for you, the trust in your care for me, and the love that you pour forth in my heart all the days of my life and all your heaven to come. Amen. Nice prayer. We have time for a, some little conversation before noonday prayer. The way I go on about this, you'd think I've got it all worked out. <laughs> I have you fooled. Please. You know, I just had a thought. This was a, a talk yesterday. You know, talking about the things that get in the way of thinking of God and praying to God and using it all the external way of the way. And then as I was reflecting, it's like, for me, one of the biggest things that get in my way are my own thoughts, my internal thoughts. And one of those Benedictine sisters, um, I always remember what she said. She was talking about her difficulty in praying and intruding thoughts. And she said, this is what I do. She says, I do all of them as votes. And then I watch them float down the river. And then I return to prayer. Way to go. And I thought, what? what Way to go. It? it is a marvelous, marvelous image and a great commendation. You, you can't, we're bombarded by stimuli all the time. You can't avoid it. Even when you want to be at your best, at your holiest, you find all kinds of crap in your head. You know, I mean, uh, this is just um, uh, the garrulous old fart talking again. Um, <laughs> you're going out to Holy Communion in the days when we could, and now we're beginning to again. And there's some stupid thing being played uh, by um, the music um, director or the choir, and it's banal, and it is meaningless, and you think, why am I listening to this stuff that makes the grass grow in Texas <laughs> when I'm going up to Holy Communion? You know, I can't help it, I'm weird. But that, that's it. it, stuff gets into your head, even without inviting it, it's there all the time. But that's a great commentation, let it just float away, okay. Here I go again, God, um, and uh, receive God and be changed into him. But that's the theme of another conference. Thank you for that. Please, Lord. I have something else that the tip of what she said might even be the same sister, who knows? But um, because my brain is always going, you know, and I try to do contemplative prayer, and I'm thinking about what I want to put for dinner, or you or who knows what she said to me she said instead of being upset about those things that come to you while you're spending time with god go with them she said pray for that person immediately or that situation and then go back she said instead of fighting it flow with it which is sort of like the boat you know going down and that's made quite a difference for me because i get so upset 
you know, that I was off track. And, and so I just immediately handle it and then go on. And it's, it's, it's healthy. I still, my brain still goes 90 miles an hour, but, you know, it, because it, for some of us, I think it's hard to spend a lot of, I want to spend more than five minutes, but then I have to remember that five minutes is Beautiful illustration. Thank you for that. Um, when we're going to talk about prayer, prayer isn't doing anything for God. You're not going to have a bad hair day when I don't pray. It works for me, and that's why we have it. And the me it works for is the me as I am, and not the ideal me that I would like to be. You know? uh, and so the thoughts come in and let them float away. And if they're good thoughts, not necessarily bad thoughts, uh, let them be absorbed into the moment of prayer. Now, um, Father Ray Carey, some of you might know his name from, from other places. He's a priest of this diocese and, and uh, a professional psychotherapist. He tells the students, he teaches a course in pastoral counseling in the in the fourth year of theology. And he recommends a practice to them, which uh, I think is uh, commendable for all of us in our own different ways. That at the beginning of the day, when he's praying his uh, morning prayer, the Liturgy of the Hours, he opens his planner. And he looks at the various appointments that he has for the day. And so he absorbs those needs and those persons and those issues into his intercessions in morning prayer. Well, it's kind of like, you know, other thoughts floating down the river. It's kind of like Laverne's um, uh, having other things go through her head when she wants a few moments of silence. It's a way to do it. You know, take what's there. Take the real you and make that work. And don't beat yourself up for not being this ideal, saintly, angelic type, which you will be sometime. Thank you. Well, when I looked at the top of page five, and you read, we read the verse together, I was thinking you could also put in the name of your friend or your spouse and that would be a beautiful meditation um, for the rest of that moment. Absolutely. Beautiful idea. Beautiful idea. Thank you. What makes this prayer so, so persuasively lovely is that he knew that when he says, um, I shall dwell in the thought of you, the hope for you, the trust in your care for me, and the love that you pour forth in my heart all the days of my life. He knew there weren't many more. You know, he, nothing was working. Uh, and to be able to pray with that deep sense of tranquil peace and absolute confidence in the love that God is, is a great grace. And I think that's what you're talking about. Thank you.